Hey everybody and welcome back. So uh, today we're going to talk about, or tonight we're going to talk about, um, big plane radio setup. So if you're flying a giant, what I call giant scale, which is to me like over 100 inches, uh, nowadays there's a lot of 80 inch and smaller that I don't really consider giant scale. But I'm also referring to when you get to that 55 pound for the AMA and higher. So in my mind, for me, giant scale is the moment you've got to be the LMA1 or LMA2 for the AMA, 55 pounds all the way up to 125 pounds, okay? Before I get into that, I want to do a little bit of house cleaning real quick. I made a video the other day. I talked about the highs and lows of RC flying. If you haven't seen that video, I think it's pretty good, but of course I made it. But in it, I talked about that clubs should, be, uh, should not discriminate against the type of aircraft that are flown. I forgot to talk about safety. There are some clubs that can't allow certain types of RC aircraft like turbines. Um, they may have a, a limit that is only electric because it's close to houses and stuff. Uh, there might be a limit on how big the airplane can be because it's close to neighborhood and houses. So I just wanted to clarify that. But let's get this thing going here, okay? So let's jump in. So the reason I'm doing this video is uh, over the last three years, I've had um, at least a dozen people reach out to me and say, hey, look, I'm going to put a radio in this big airplane I'm building or I designed or it's a big contraption or they bought it from somebody. And there is an awful lot to consider the moment you're going to start putting a radio in something that is over 55 pounds. Okay. First of all, it's a big airplane. Um, I know a little airplane can do a lot of damage to a person, but big airplanes uh, are also perceived more dangerous. I've had people walk up and say, you can't fly that, that's not AMA legal. And I said, yeah, it is, it's like 60 pounds. You can't be over 55 pounds. There's a lot of AMA members have no idea that there's the program for over 55 pounds. But when you get into big airplanes, you have long servo leads, you have really high torque servos you need to move the flying surfaces. Keep in mind, if you're in that over 55, you have to show on your documentation or your paperwork that you have the right size servos. You have to, well, you, you, if you're the inspector for under 77 pounds, you have to sign off that you know that you've done the airplane right. If there's an inspector on it where it's over the 77 pound, they're gonna look at your math to make sure you've got enough servo for the flying surfaces. So I'm really, really passionate about safety if you've ever watched my videos. So one of the things to think about is, and I've experimented, but I don't want to tell you this is the rule. This is what worked for me. You know my videos. I'm only sharing my experiences and my thoughts. I don't go out there and become a Google warrior and try to tell you what I assume or uh, allegedly what I think is going to work. I know what works for me. So when you think about like my MSL2 here, oh, 188 inches, um, the torque I needed on the servos for the elevators needed to be 470, I'm sorry, needed to be 425 or something like that. We'll see it later. But I opted for a 472 ounce servo because that fell in the sweet spot. Some of my servo leads were 72 inches long. Now, I've done some testing on how long I could get a servo lead before it quit working. And there's some interesting stuff going on, but you know me, I try to keep this super simple. It's a KISS principle. So to keep this in the most basic and simple uh, explanation is there's voltage that runs the motor in the servo, but there's a signal that's telling that servo where to go. And if you have, let's say, 12 foot of servo wire and run a servo, it probably will be fine. The moment you put the second server on there, it starts pulling the voltage down and the signal starts to get really glitchy. You put a third server on there, servo on that 12 foot lead and it probably won't work at all. But you don't wanna be experimenting with a 55 pound or over airplane saying, oh, what do I think is gonna work? I would suggest you talk to dealers, you talk to the manufacturers, you could talk to me, I'll give you my opinion. But you can't guess on these big airplanes. There's just way too much liability. There's, and it's perception. You take a big airplane and fly into the side of a house and the news gets a hold of that and all of a sudden the whole hobby's 
has airplanes falling out of the skies, you know, killing um, ducks and geese and kids and everything. It's just chaos, okay? So it's very important that we do this safely and, and, and do it um, in a very, very thought out and well known way. Best way I can explain it. So when I was building the C-130, I had already had experience with experimenting on my B-36, if you remember that. Now, both of those planes never flew, and I know there's some haters out there. I had to sell them because uh, I was running out of money for the hobby. But what I learned on both of those aircraft, the C-130 had uh, 24 servos and the B-36 had 42 servos. And I'm going to get really into this in a little bit. But what I want to talk about is all four of these planes here are giant scale. The MSL-1 flew off what I call a standard system, which was I had a receiver, had long leads, had high torque servos. And if I had two servos that needed to run off one channel, I used a servo Y. You know, it's a Y cable. That way you can put one servo, I mean two servos on a channel. You can also mix your channels. So if you have a 16 channel radio, and I'm just making this up, and let's say you had four channels for, I mean, you needed four servos for flaps. In your programming, you could use four channels to run those four servos. So I want you to think about this for a minute because I'm gonna get into some really confusing stuff and I'm gonna try to really say this as simplistic as I can. But a single channel coming out of receiver on a single wire running out 12 feet to a single servo, I tested and it worked flawlessly. But as you know, if I added a servo to it, it pulled down the voltage and the signal would fail and it wouldn't work. But if you have two channels, let's say channel 10 and 11, and 11 is programmed to your flap, I'm sorry, 10 is programmed to your flap, 11 is programmed to your flap, both of those servos will move with your flap switch. Let's say you had four servos for the flaps. You could do channels 10, 11, 12, and 13, all the way out in theory to 12 foot leads to, 12, to four servos, and you would be glitch free. But there's new systems now that you don't need to do it. I call that old school. Now, you could still do it and do it fine. So if you had a 16 or 18 channel radio and you knew how to program it, you could very quickly use um, multiple servos for the elevators, multiple servos for the ailerons, and just programming it into the right channels, okay? So when we think about the C-130, and I'm just gonna talk really briefly on this, and I'll, I'll dig into this in a minute. I spent hours and hours trying to figure out how I'm going to make a 24 servo layout work a little bit more cleanly than my B36 did. My B36 had four receivers. My C130 is gonna have one receiver with a system called S-Bus. And I'm gonna dig into that in a minute, but the four receivers is what I called old school because I needed channels. S-Bus, uh, and there's also a power box out there and I'll talk about that toward the end too. So I don't want everybody to think I'm just favoring one type of program here, even though I am totally in love with Futaba and I won't use anything but Futaba. Before I get too deep, I want to talk about my sponsor, RTL Fasteners. Fantastic people. You need blind nuts, washers, lock washers, nylocks, uh, metric, standard, servo screws. They've got it all. And if you use a super top secret code DA30 and you buy more than $50 in product, you'll get 30% off your order. So now we're going to talk about um, what radio I need. Okay, now just earlier we talked about how many servos you're gonna need. Now we're gonna talk about the radio, but we're gonna kind of loop back around to the servos when I talk about the system. So I'm in love with the um, 18SZ Futaba. Um, it's not a cheap radio, but it's not a $3,000 radio, okay? Um, I think they're around a grand, $1,000, something like that. Maybe times have changed, but I think I paid that. Um, and another thing I just wanna make clear is I'm technically part of Team Futaba, but believe it or not, I bought all my Futaba gear before I was part of that, and I paid full price for it. I very rarely will take a discount from anybody just in case their stuff is garbage. I can tell you how it's garbage. But I fell in love with the Futaba, and I fell in hate with Futaba. 
So with the love part is, to me, it's the best signal to your receiver. I, I knock on wood, I have never had a glitch. I've never had any problem with having absolute crystal clear radio connectivity. I have telemetry coming down telling me what my GPS has given me, air, well, ground speed, uh, altitude, all the different things, rock solid. The hate part of Futaba, which you get over pretty quick, is it programs unlike any other radio I've ever had. So if you speak English, you're going to have to learn French or Spanish, okay? Because <clears throat> it, it, it programs completely different than any radio I ever owned. I mean, I loved back in the day my Autronics. Um, I had JR. I had Futaba in the early days, and back then it was still a little bit wonky, but they're different. But if you look at the owner's manual and talk to other people like me, and I got a friend, Berger, who knows everything about Futaba, you'll fall in love with it. So now what I want to do is talk about this S-Bus system. <clears throat> so the best way to explain the S-Bus is, is you have a network, basically one wire that's leaving the receiver, and you basically run that out to hubs, and out of the hubs, you run to servos. And you program each servo for what channel it's on. You don't do it in your radio. So if you had eight flat servos, and your flat uh, channel is going to be six, you would program all eight of those servos to channel six, and when you flip the button on six, they'll all move together. If you've got four on your elevators, two on each half, program all of those to whatever your elevator channel is, and they all. That's the beauty of it. Um, but one of the things that people have brought up a few times, which is a little bit frustrating to me, is they start talking about, you know, the way I lay it out in my airplane. And to be honest, it's not complicated if you understand, you know, what the hubs are and you understand there's two types of hub. There's a hub that just splits out to the three servos or there's a hub that you can plug a battery into. And, you know, I've had a couple of people, and I'll talk about that here in a minute, but I've had a couple of people talk about, well, I don't want one battery running the whole system. You don't have to. But in an S-Bus system, you don't have a whole fan of wires going out from the receiver all, all over the airplane. I basically have one wire coming out of my receiver. Now, you can still have channels come out of the receiver that are straight to servos, and I'll show you how I use that for redundancy. So you still have, let's say, one through eight coming out of the, the receiver. Then you have an S-Bus wire. You can still use one through eight. So I actually use one going to one half of my elevator, two going to one half of my ailerons. Um, and that way, if my S-Bus wire, that one big wire failed, I still have control of my airplane. Okay. Um, but And I also want to talk about the programmability. So when you've got a... When you look at a SBS servo and you can plug it into the back of your radio, you go through some windows and you tell it what channel it's going to run off of. It's really that easy. But also some of their servos have telemetry come back off it. So if you're on the SBS circuit, you can plug in different accessories and actually record what the amp load is on that servo. Or you can actually hear it in your ear if you set a warning. So let's say I set my warning at 5 amps. My servo pulls 5 amps, I'll hear a warning, and, and it will tell me what's going on. So it's really, really, it's really cool, okay? Uh, if you're a nerd like me, if you're just wanting to fly, I still think S-Bus is one of the coolest systems in the world. So I'm going to go back now and talk a little bit deeper about the basic reason I love it is that it doesn't matter how long your wire runs out for the signal. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. I think you can run out like 30 or 40 feet. I, I know I've tested it at 50 feet and everything still worked good. But at that 50 feet, you're gonna have to have some other batteries, okay? So what I wanna show you here is, right here is you got a battery going in your receiver and then on all this other cluster of servos down here, I have another battery. And that's the way I set up my system. You want to have the same milliamp and the same number of cells, or if you're going to go through a voltage regulator, make sure the voltage regulators are set at the same voltage because you don't have uneven voltage going into the system. But to me, this is the sweetest thing. But now let's say you say, hey, Dad, I own 500 normal servos. 
Am I going to have to replace everything I have? No, you don't. So this is called an SBD-1, and I own like 30 of these things. So what it does is you can plug this in to that little programmer there, and you can identify which one of these outputs are going to be a channel. So you take your standard servo. Let's say on, I designate the first wire there, number one. I plug it in, I roll the wheel to channel 16, I hit the little program button, now that wire is outputting channel 16 on my radio. If I wanted to make all of those 16s, let's say you had three uh, servos for your flaps on the right and three servos for your flaps on the left, you could program two of these all to your flap channel, plug it into the SBUS circuit, um, or I like to call a network, and you're going to be good to go. When you think about the C-130, and, and I'm going to talk old school toward the end of this, the B-36, but the C-130 was going to be my first plane that I went to SBUS on, okay? And I wanted to use all of my old servos and a few SBUS servos. So I was going to put SBUS servos in a few places on the plane, like ailerons and elevator, because I'd like to know what the amp load is on it, just, just for me being a nerd. But everything else in this is going to be standard servos. And... If you look at this picture here, you'll see all of these little, um, like, three-furs, I call them. Well, those are the, the SBUS hub. I'm sorry, those are my SBD-1s plugged into my SBUS circuit. So every one of these servos here were standard servos that were talking to the SBUS. hope that makes sense. So now, another thing I always do religiously is I create these spreadsheets to know where all my channels and everything is talking to my radio. So if you notice here, Eleron uh, 1 and Elevator 2 went directly to the uh, receiver. Um, throttles for 1 through 4 were S-Bus because I had four ESCs in there. And I was going to break it up on some channels, but it was part of the S-Bus. Um, rudder went directly to the um, um, radio. Um, actually, my other side of my elevator and Eleron also went right to my radio. So I had everything directly connected to the receiver. And S-Bus was just running flaps and the rear door, the landing gears and stuff like that. So one of the reasons I like SBUS, look, there are so many other systems out there that I don't know about and I don't want to even talk about them um, except maybe acknowledge that they're out there. But when you start thinking about the accessories you can plug into an SBUS system, you can plug in an accessory to know the voltage of your batteries. You can plug a, um, they're called sensors. You can plug in a battery sensor. You can plug in a current sensor to know if you're electric, how much current. You can plug an RPM sensor in to see your gas engine's RPM. You can plug a temperature sens sensor in there to know what the head temperature of your engine is or if your batteries are about ready to catch on fire. You can put the GPS in, which I love because it tells me basically my ground speed and my altitude uh, in something else. I, I think there's three things. I can't remember what they are. Um, I just love the fact that with SBUS, I have all this flexibility. But there's also a thing called the power box system. And I don't know much about it, but I have quite a few friends that fly it. So I would beg you to find out either through Facebook or the forums, RC groups, Flying Giants, whoever, and say, look, people, who owns this? Don't say who knows about it. Who owns and uses it? And let them tell you what they think about it. Okay, don't ask people who heard, because they can just go out and Google it and say, oh, yeah, the, the power box does this. Ask them if they own and use a system. That's really important, okay? Um, and basically with this, the receiver plugs in, you plug batteries in, you have up, up to like 26 channels. They're really cool or more. I think they go higher than that. I just don't want to talk too much about it because I don't personally own it. Now you got to think about servo size in your system. So on the upper left-hand corner is that calculator I created for understanding how big my flying surfaces are and how much torque I need out of my servo. So if you, like the MSL2, uh, needed 422 ounces of torque, and I put a 477-ounce torque servo on it, so I'm good to go. But I also flew a 90-inch plane one time. Now, it didn't weigh 55 pounds. It weighed about 46 pounds. It was a lead sled. And um, we ran out of elevator coming out of a big loop and just about crashed it because we stalled the servos. 
And I have had a plane crash because of stalling servos. It wasn't mine. It was somebody else's. But it's really super important if you're over 55 pounds to really know that you've got enough torque to those flying surfaces to fly them. Again, you take a big Marauder or a big B-25 Mitchell uh, and fly it into a house or a car or hit a person and the news is going to have a heyday with us. Safety, safety first, people, okay? So, like, this servo right here is the one that I use in my MSL2, which is the yellow and blue airplane. I run a 6.6 volt system. That's what I set my um, voltage regulators at. I use the castle ones. Um, the reason I do that is when you run at 7.2 volts, some servos are always trying to center themselves, and you'll see them start twitching a little bit. At 6.6 volts, I don't have that problem. Um, now, if my, my surfaces were totally perfectly balanced, like they probably should be, I wouldn't see any of that twitch at all. But most of us don't have perfectly balanced. I try to get my flying surfaces as balanced as I can. Some people don't balance at all. But I run at 6.6, .6, which gives me 472.3 ounces of torque, and I only needed 422. Now, as we start to close this down, I want to talk about the B36 for a minute. This was the initial, on the right was the air system that it needed because my all my landing gear were air. Um, I'm trying to think what else was air on that airplane. I think that's it, um, which was just a tremendous amount of crap in the airplane. But on the left was a servo layout. So when you think about taking an airplane this size in the air, if you're over 55 pounds, this was going to be about 105. If you are over 55 pounds, you need to sit back and seriously ask yourself, do I have the skills? Do I have the experience? Do I have the knowledge? And, and I don't want to scare you away because if you've got friends that's done it and they're going to make sure you've done everything right and set up everything right, <clears throat> or don't waste your time. Don't build an entire airplane that's going to be LMA2 and the AMA and then have an inspector come and look at it and say, I can improve this to fly. There's too much wrong with it. So when you start to get into giant airplanes, think of the responsibility and the money and the risk you have that the AMA inspector might not sign it off if it's over 77 pounds because they're the one that signs it off. It's under 77, like two ounces, you sign it off, but you're basically signing like an affidavit and sending it to the AMA that you guarantee this plane's safe to fly. Uh, we got to take large airplanes serious, people. So the uh, B-36 had 42 servos. And I uh, went to four receivers. Everything was tested and was working. I had an AMA inspector friend who had gone over the airplane preliminarily and said, yep, I'm going to prove this when you're done, Damon. And then this air system here, don't forget, this had four servos that actually actuated my air valves that actuated my air system. So you can't forget the importance of the best way I can explain this is and I, and I want to say this in a way that it's, it's positive if you build a Zeroli Corsair and it's got air retracts in it and it's got servos and everything and you've flown it let's say 50 or 60 flights and you understand it and then you build a B-25 a twin engine you feel good about it or you build one of Don Smith's planes, like I built a B-29 way back when. I wish I still had that. I'd love to make it electric. Um, slowly progress into giant scale. Two years ago, right, well, no, actually, I don't know, right before COVID, about six months before COVID, a really cool guy reached out to me. I uh, was very timid in some of the emails saying, you know, look, I just finished this plan. I'm not going to say the name of it because um, it came in way overweight and I still think the manufacturer is dreaming when they say what the target weight is on it and that's all I'm going to say so I drove up he lived in northern Indiana I drove up and looked at the airplane and he admittedly say I have no idea what I'm doing when it comes to setting up the electronics in this airplane and I said well you know let's look at what you got and he had good radio gear but he had about one-fifth of what he needed. He needed to spend about another $2,000 on the right servo. Well, I shouldn't say $2,000. I probably am exaggerating. I'm thinking about what I've spent. So, like my servos, my high-torque servos are about $225 a piece. Okay, when you need, 
I needed five of those to fly the MSL-2. Okay, so right there was, what, $1,200. Um, well, yeah, whatever, $1,000. <laughs> My math, I'm sorry. But, you know, when you need four at two you you're pretty close to 1000 Throw in a fifth, that's over 1000 <clears throat> I needed $1,000 in servos to get that plane to meet the over 55 rules. But what happens if that plane had 20 servos? That is a boatload of money, okay? So you need to really make sure you size the radio, the, the, the servos right in these systems. So the elevators, you gotta make sure you're doing exactly what the math is, okay? The ailerons, they're important too. They're not as important as your elevator, okay? You should still follow the rules. The rudder, very important, but not as important as the elevator, okay? You get where I'm going with this? Flaps. You might put a standard servos on there. Here's the problem with flaps, though, with me, because I saw this happen. A friend of mine was just kicking ass in the downwind, dumped his flaps. The plane started to roll over. He yelled he was in trouble. He did an entire roll. And as he came out of the other one, uh, he instinctively, luckily, pulled his flaps back up, and the plane was fine. And I just got to his, like, right shoulder... So what's going on? He goes, my flaps made the plane roll. I mean, I almost lost it. He was shaking. And this was a big uh, Sky Raider. And I said, um, don't use your flaps. He goes, I'm not going to. So we landed the plane fine. Taxiing in, he drops the flaps. They both move. We put it up on his stand. They move fine. And I'm like, was it a radio glitch? And he's like, I have no idea. And he says, but I was hauling ass. He goes, I was coming out of a dive in the downwind. So I held his, his um, flaps and he dumped them and I could basically hold them up. I said, what servos are in there? He goes, standard servos. I'm like, you need some high torque servos on those flaps because when you're flying fast. Now this was the weird thing about the airplane that also when you dump flaps, you need some down elevator. I mean, you normally mix in down elevator. Not all planes are this way. I'm just telling you that mine have been like this. I don't want to lead you astray. But when he um, dumped the flaps uh, and the plane started to roll, it actually started to roll level on him. And luckily, he was a kick-ass pilot and, and pull, got the nose up before it got upside down. And, I mean, he was yelling bloody um, murder help, you know. I, I, my plane's out of control. So make sure, even though you think flaps might not be that important, you can stall flaps. And if one stays up and one stays down, you're in for a hell of a ride. So it's something to think about. Again, I don't want to make this only about Futaba, okay? There are other systems out there. Now, I love Futaba, and I'm also part of Team Futaba, but I want to be fair to my fans. I don't know, just like I love Diet Pepsi and don't like Diet Coke, you like, might like Diet Coke. And some of you don't even like diet because you're not diabetic. So, um, uh, whoopsie. So, basically, everybody... The moment you go over 55 pounds on an airplane, you have a responsibility that puts you in a very, I don't want to ever say elite crowd or a special crowd. It puts you in the danger zone <laughs> that you've got to be responsible for what you're sticking in that airplane. You know, I'm getting a lot of emails saying, hey, could you explain power systems on big airplanes and all of this? And I've tried to handle that. And, and if you've watched my videos and you don't understand it, I need to figure out if I'm just not explaining it right or if there's a better way I can do it. Because I have flown big gas engines, okay? I mean, up, well, up to 150cc uh, 3W uh, on my half-scale pits. Uh, and a lot of glow. I mean, every size below that 150ccs. Um, but I guess what's important is that you really understand, um, you, you know, it's like I've done videos on the S-Bus. If you want to go and search DAG214, S-Bus, Hutaba, you'll probably find my other YouTube videos where I dove in a little bit deeper on it. But it's just really important that you understand that um, I always try to be kind to people. But sometimes I just shake my head. 
because the radio systems that people jam into an airplane and that wire, you know, I saw a guy one time with the stick he uses to start his propeller. When he put his wing on, he was using that to jam the wire down into the fuselage so he could get the wing on. You don't realize that radio is what makes your airplane safe. Okay? I see people having brownout on airplanes that they just kind of go dead and then they get it back and they go, wow, I wonder what caused that. Well, then we look at it when they land and they got little micro servos on huge flying services. They're jamming that little servo up. They got a 4.8 volt battery in there and then they're wondering why a, a servo stalled. Um, or, and keep in mind, when you truly stall a servo, if you have a way to measure the amp, the amps just go ballistic on it. it it's crazy the load you're putting on your system when you stall a servo. So um, I hope you appreciate these videos, everybody. I'm trying not to, I'm trying to stay safe. So I just don't have people saying, well, that's garbage. Because this is what's worked for me. So it's not garbage to me. Okay. So if you're building, um, and there's plenty of beautiful big birds out there. If you don't know exactly how to do it, because I've got three people right now that's reached out to me just in the last month and a half saying, hey, I've got some pretty big birds. Can you help me or talk to me about it? I love to help people. Um, and it's one reason I decided to go ahead and get this video done because big airplanes are really starting to pop up at the airfield. And I just want you all to think about what that means to you. And as I end this, I'm gonna explain one thing that really bothers me about over 55. I have met what I would call pretty well-known pilots in our industry that fly 60-pound airplanes, 58-pound airplanes, and say they're 55 because they know no one's going to ever weigh it. And that's true. I mean, if somebody came up and said, hey, we're going to weigh your airplane, I'd say, okay, do it, but I'm leaving. If you can't trust me that I've got the paperwork and I'm not a liar, then I'm out of here. But on the other hand, I get it because I know people who have flown over the 100 pound limit when it used to be 100, called it 100. Flew over 55, called it 55. I don't know if anybody's flown over the 125 with, because they upped the limit, thank goodness. But if you're lying, you're gonna be liable. Because believe it or not, if there's an injury or somebody's hurt, then they're gonna weigh that airplane. And they find out you're outside the AMA guidelines and the AMA is like, we can't help you. So just think about safety first, okay? So rock on everybody. Thanks for all of the people that subscribed this last 28 days. My YouTube's finally starting to gain traction. Please like and subscribe if you haven't. And let me know what kind of videos you want in the comments. Take care, everybody. Be safe and have an awesome uh, night or day or morning, wherever you're at. Rock on.